you have to go into Omnibus's YouTube channel. Oh, hi. <laughs> well, we're on Omnibus's YouTube channel. Hi, everybody, and welcome to So This Is What Happened and to Omnibus Theater. Thank you for joining us tonight. We have an amazing group of people who are going to tell stories. And I just wanted to say a few words about Omnibus Theater if you haven't been there uh, yourself. It's a wonderful place in South London. And it's also very special because the building was a library for over a hundred years. And when the library closed, instead of becoming another block of flats or a massive estate agents, the community got together and somehow it became this thriving theater. And it's become a part of the community very quickly in six years. We really couldn't do without it. And one of the reasons we wanted to do this tonight is so this is what happened is all about stories. And you can imagine in a library, it's all about words. And that was one of the things that we loved about it. So um, we're going to hear from six people and uh, we have three rules for so this is what happened, which they all know about. And that is that the story has to be true. The story has to be from their own life and the story has to be 10 minutes. So if they go way over 10 minutes, um, I'll try and use some kind of sign to let them know, but, uh, and then they'll start to wrap up, but that's not gonna happen. So we're not gonna worry about that. Uh, so we're so excited. Thank you for joining us tonight. And first up, we have got Fayon. And Fayon uh, describes herself as having been born in Coventry, nurtured in Brixton. She's a radio presenter, TV presenter. She uh, teaches creative workshops to stroke patients, motiv motivational workshops in schools, and she lights up any room that she enters. So we're so pleased to have her here tonight. Take it away, Fayon. Thank you so much, Laurel, and hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so my story starts in 1993. Yeah, I know, I was a baby, but no, it was 1993, and a work friend and I, Jacqueline, we bonded over the fact that we both loved Prince. Oh, the things we could talk about when it came to the purple Yoda. So... In 1993, there were no real mobile phones. I didn't have one, yeah? Not because I couldn't afford one, it's just because it just wasn't a thing. Social media, we haven't even gone there yet. So if you wanted to communicate, you had to do it via word of mouth, the landline, hearsay, reading something. And I mean, I've been a fan of Prince since I was about 11. Jacqueline since she was like a teenager and when we heard Prince was coming to London we nearly lost our minds so we were like how are we going to get to see him we've just got to get out we just got to get out and like see if we can see if we can find Prince so um we had word that he was going to be in the UK in London for about four days so we came up with this plan that we would literally go clubbing every night, every night, and just to see if we could pick up on the vibe and catch a glimpse of Prince. So, started off on the Wednesday night, we got glammed up, off we went, we hit a couple of bars, got our ears to the ground, not a sniff, nothing. Thursday night, we went out, same thing again, two clubs in one night, still nothing. People were talking about Prince, but nothing, not a peep. It's Friday night now. So Jacqueline and I were due to meet up in our local bar in South London. And when she turned up, she looked rough, really rough. She caught a cold and um, she wasn't well at all, but she was like, no, it's, it's cool. We're gonna go out. I said, okay, let's go. So we found ourselves up at, I think it was the Milk Bar that night. For those of you who remember the Milk Bar, it was just always a sensational night. So even though we were on Prince Hunt, you know, we were still having a great time. We were meeting so many people and talking about him. So we had another fantastic night out, still no Prince. 
Now, I've seen Prince once before at this time at Birmingham NEC, and I was just blown away by his performance. And just to know that, you know, a legend of that, uh, that magnitude was like in sniffing distance somewhere in London. It just was just too much for me. So nothing on the Friday night. On the Saturday, chilled out, caught up with my sleep, got ready and Jacqueline asked if I could meet her at hers that night. No problem. So I took myself off to Jacqueline's house. She opened the door. She's got a dressing gown on. She looks awful. The flu has completely taken over and she's like, I can't go. I'm like, Jacqueline, no, you've got to come out. She's like, I don't think I can. So we saw, we sort of looked at things that we could do to pepper up. We gave her ginger tea. We put her in a hot bath. We gave her things to smell. The Epsom salts were out. The Olbersol was out. Nothing, nothing at all was working. She just felt awful. She was like, Fayon, you're going to have to go on without me. I'm like, no, Jack, what if I see him? She's like, you're going to have to go without me. <sighs> Off I went then headed off into town, went to a bar where I knew there'd be people that I knew. Where's Jacqueline? She's got a cold, she can't make it. Okay, somebody had received a tip that Prince was gonna be at a bar in Holborn. Um, it's a bar club, it's called Browns. It's on Queen Street, I believe. And we were like, okay, let's get down there. So it must have been around midnight, 12.30, and we walk into the Browns and the place is jumping. And we're like, there's just something, there's just, there's something in the air here. So um, we're dancing, we're having a good time. About an hour or so has gone, still no sign. Next minute, I hear an iconic sound that I cannot, I mean, I know this sounds so well, and I know it's the start of Get Off. And I'm up. I am dropping it on the dance floor right now. I'm in my own world, yeah? Get off. She's in a one next day. Get off. Only call you after if I say I can. Anyway, so I'm getting down on the dance floor. It's dark, really dark. But I'm just doing my thing. I'm in the zone. And there was a figure on the dance floor kind of coming towards me, getting down with me. I'm turning my back, I'm spinning. I'm not really aware of this person. I'm just doing my thing. 23 positions in the let's down. Get up, only cut you after if I say I can. There's a group of people around me, lots of eyes on me. I can kind of see that there's something going on around me, but I'm just going, just getting down. And this person is still in my environment, kind of dancing with me every now and again, moving backwards. And I kind of clock that this person has got two larger people with them. But, you know, I'm just like, fine, just getting down. Mm -mm -mm. The tune ends and I come off the dance floor and I'm like, Whew, great tune and people are just looking at me and watching and looking and I'm just like smashed it <laughs> obviously smashed it on the dance floor and I went over to my friends and they're like did he did he say anything to you and I'm like who they're like prince I like when they're like just now I like what they're like, I'm like, what? They're like, you were just dancing with Prince. And I'm like, no, I wasn't. They're like, yes, you were. I'm like, 
And it just kind of hit me. This person was kind of like the same kind of build as me. Yeah, come to think of it, the hair was kind of high. The two people with him could have been his bouncers, but I was just in the zone. And I'm like, where, where, where did he go? Which way did he go? And they're like, he went off to VIP. So I peg it down to VIP and I'm like, excuse me, excuse me, I've got to get through here. Prince has just gone upstairs. And they're like, yeah, we know you can't come through. I'm like, I just didn't know what to do with myself. So then my friends were like consoling me. They're like, listen, you've danced with Prince. I said, but I didn't know I was dancing with Prince. And they were like, come on, let's have a drink. So we stayed in the club. I kind of kept one eye towards VIP, but I didn't see him. And then it was time to go. So we got in the foyer and I'm just like getting my coat. And all of a sudden the doors just flung open. The entourage comes through. Prince walks straight past me and I knew it was him because he had the iconic slave on his cheek. And as quick as he went through and past, there was a car waiting outside. He jumped in it, Whoo, screech your wheels, bam, Prince has gone out of my life. What a night. And you know what? Looking back on this whole situation, I'm kind of glad I didn't know I was dancing with Prince because maybe I just wouldn't have let go as much as I did. And Prince loves his fans. He loves his fans. And I think to see somebody getting down to one of his own tunes must have just been enough. And forever I will hold this story in my heart. I've seen Prince another couple of times since then, and he remains one of my all-time favorite artists. Rest in peace, Prince. Oh, oh. Fayon, thank you so much. You know what? Prince has nothing on you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, listen, thank you. So next up, we've got Dele. And Dele is one of those people who does so many things and just makes it look ridiculously easy. He's a lawyer. He's an author. He's written an epic book on the history of Nigeria called A Fatherless People, amongst other books. He's a community activist. He's also just one of the most wonderful people. And I think you'll agree, has one of the best voices you will ever hear. So there you go, Dele. Being a barrister was never my dream. It was my father's dream. It was a dream that he had entertained all of his life, but he saw the fulfillment of that dream in me. And so, Every evening when he returned from his civil service job in Whitehall, uh, he would sit me down at my desk in his room, get, taking me through the English grammar lessons, the math lessons, with a view to the fulfillment of that dream. I guess he would have been happy when I was finally called to the bar in 1985. There I was, with a black gown and a white wig, amongst those people who spend their days in court distinguishing lies from truth, uh, good conduct from bad conduct, forming judgments on other people's lives. Those judgments that will often determine the course of the individual's uh, life and futures. Some lives destroyed, some lives opened up. By virtue of the training that I got in researching and presenting evidence, that's how I became an author. And since then, I've written uh, several books. But it nearly did not happen. To understand why, I've got to take you back to my secondary school days. I was in the lower sixth form when I remember the occasion when a police car pulled up outside my house where I was living with my parents. And I was asked a question. Do you play tennis? Yes, I do. Do you have a tennis racket? Yes, I have got a tennis racket. 
Could we see it? I produced a tennis racket. It was a Slazinger tennis racket. Did you know this racket was stolen? I had always been brought up to tell the truth. Ours was a disciplined household. And so I said, yes, I knew it was stolen. Will you please come with us? I had a second to go inside and tell my parents that I had to go along with the police. And the next moment, there I was in the back of this police car, sandwiched in between two police officers. And we drove down to Hendon Police Station. You see, what had happened was that the rackets had been stolen by one of my friends at secondary school, in the sixth form as well. And he had sold the rackets to several of us. The white guys were smart, I guess, because they said, didn't know it was stolen. And they had no further trouble whatsoever. But yours truly, who had been brought up to always tell the truth, ended up in the back of the police car. The day came when I had to go to Hendon Magistrates Court for my trial. I had consulted a local solicitor under the legal aid scheme, my first encounter with a lawyer. And he had taken me through the, the story, as it were. And then I explained to him that, well, you know, when I said that I knew it was stolen, it wasn't that I knew that at the time I bought the racket. It was afterwards, you see, because I had this passion for tennis. It was so deep that I studied tennis rackets and I knew that there was a difference between a gut spring racket and a nylon spring racket. And the, what happened was that when I went to, and how I realized that was, there was an occasion when I passed through Tottenham Court Road and saw a sports shop, and I saw what looked like the same racket as mine, with a price tag that was then in the 35, 40 pounds range. And I went into the store. I said, why is your racket 35, 40 pounds? Because I bought mine for five pounds. And the storekeeper said, well, this is a gut string racket. And the others are their nylon string rackets. So probably what you have is a nylon string racket. And he showed me how to look at the difference. So when I went back home, I looked at my racket carefully. And I realized that it was actually a gut string racket, not a nylon string racket. So what I had got for five pounds, the true price tag was 35, 40 pounds. That it was at that point that I realized that it was a stolen racket. Well, that's your case then. So the day came, rolled along to the magistrate's court. I remember the judge sitting there and he looked at me. Well, young man, what do you have to say? I told the story that yes, I bought this racket, but I did not know at the time that I bought it that it was stolen. It was afterwards that I discovered that the racket that I had was a more expensive form. And that led me to the conclusion that it was stolen. And that's why I responded to the police as I did. And the magistrate, had, and my solicitor had told the magistrate about my educational aspirations, that I had then seven, eight GCSEs and I was reading for four A-levels. I think that may have influenced that judge on that occasion because when a moment came and he came to pronounce his judgment, there was a moment of silence. And then he said, you may go. I almost did not register the words properly because at that point, 
my life was in suspense, literally, because my father was a tough disciplinarian. He taught with the whip and the cane. So you can imagine what would have happened if the verdict had been otherwise. That life would probably have ended at that point. When the judge asked me, what do you want to do with yourself? I said, I want to be a lawyer. You can imagine the look on his face when he smiled. I look back to that moment every single time, whenever I'm anywhere near the courts, how close I came to never being the lawyer that my father wanted me to be. And certainly, had I not gone along that path, I would certainly not have been the author that I have become. It always calls to mind one of my favorite films, a film called Sliding Doors. It's the story of a guy who's running to catch this train. He runs down the stairs and the train door is about to close. On one version of the events, he catches the train and he meets what became the love of his life. On the other version of the events, he misses that train and his life takes a completely different course. My story could have been very, very different. If on that day, that judge had said, guilty. I was a 16, going on 17. I had the rest of my life ahead of me. All that I've become, all that I've achieved, all the cases that I've argued, all the cases that I've won, and indeed some that I've lost, all the books that I've written would never have been written had that judge said guilty. That is my story. Wow, thank you, Dele. Um, I wish you could hear us. We're all kind of applauding, but we're not making any noise. So we're kind of doing whatever we can to show you how incredible that was. And um, if we'd actually been at Omnibus, you have the ability to make a room go entirely silent. Thank you. Next up, we have Danny. And Danny is another polymath. He's an actor. He's a filmmaker. He has told stories in over 30 countries. He's also a best-selling author. He has been on Amazon's number one. Uh, he's really incredible. I had the good fortune to um, make a movie with him called Entebbe, in which we are pretty much entirely cut out. And that one day is a fantastic story in itself. And hopefully Danny or I can tell it. But right now, uh, he's got another fantastic story to tell. Thank you, Danny. Thank you very much. So the story I'm going to tell is um, the story about how a Mossad agent was once asked to track me down. Now, I'm going to take you back, uh, like Finder, to the 1990s. And uh, my great cousin, Bernie, was in love with an Israeli girl called Talia. Now, Talia had a father who was rumored to be a top agent in Mossad. There from the start, this is the Israeli uh, secret services. And um, I, I, uh, I can't use his real name, so I'm just gonna call him Mr. M. Now, Mr. M had a reputation for being a prankster and a showman. And to give you an example, one time he showed up at a party in Leeds, a fancy dress party on a camel. Now, God knows where you find a camel in Leeds. I don't know if there are any camels anywhere near Leeds, but somehow he was the kind of guy that could make that happen. Now, my first encounter with his 
uh, with his showmanship was actually at the wedding of, of Bernie and Talia. When I got there, this wedding was in Israel in a, in a kibbutz. I got to the hotel room and on the table in the hotel room was a script. He'd written a play, uh, a play that was meant to star all of his family and all of our family, a play that we were never going to rehearse, that we were going to perform the next evening at the wedding. And on the bed was some kind of horrendous toga or some kind of cloth covering that we were, it was a costume that we were meant to wear. Now I knew this wedding wasn't gonna be just any old wedding because on the morning of the wedding, I come down the stairs and I see in the lobby of the hotel, the bride-to-be literally with her arms against the side of the lift, refusing to get out of the lift. Her two sisters are like pulling her like crazy. It's like, this is her own wedding. She's refusing to go to her own wedding, probably because she knew that Mr. M was gonna kind of turn it into his wedding. And sure enough, we're there waiting for the, the couple to arrive. It's an outdoor wedding where all the guests are gathered in two aisles outdoors and a car pulls up, um, chauffeur driven with Mr. M and Talia and suddenly the engine at the front starts smoking. The chauffeur gets out also probably another Mossad agent and there's this extraordinary controlled explosion in the car and it's all great, everyone's having a great laugh. Meanwhile, Mr. M has handcuffed himself to his daughter, literally. He gets the key, he throws away the key and now everyone's scrabbling around trying to find the key. He walks down the aisle, it's all a great show. It was only gonna get worse though because after the dinner was the performance. Now, by now it's about eight o'clock in the evening and uh, everybody is gathered around chairs in this kind of amphitheater outdoors. And behind the stage is a, is a big fence and there's two big lights on, on scaffolds shining down on this um, little amphitheater. And the play that he'd written was a kind of biblical epic uh, where Bernie, my cousin, was playing a goat herd and he was uh, traveling across the hills of Jerusalem to find the beautiful princess played by Talia. And my mum and dad had been asked to make an entrance. In fact, my mum, led by my dad, to make an entrance on a donkey. Now, my mum hates all animals. The reason why she hates all animals uh, is because she's Hungarian. Now, the reason why Hungarians don't like animals is because she was brought up with rabies and all animals uh, are, you know, could be a potential risk. So my mum persuaded my dad to get on the donkey. He almost broke the donkey's back. Meanwhile, in the script, it says that on the, you know, that the goat herd should blow a whistle. That's what it said in the script. So at some particular point, we, you know, we're all there with our scripts. I'm the narrator, by the way, in the middle of the whole action, trying to piece this chaos together. And so he blows his whistle. And then something extraordinary happens, something that was not in the script. As he blows his whistle, suddenly the fence behind us opened and in rush a hundred goats. Now, this had been prearranged by the master prankster himself, Mr. M, uh, with the local goat herd. These goats run in. Now, we're caught in this. Me, my family, my mum, my dad, we're like stranded in this mass of goats. This is a wedding for goodness sake. And we're caught there and we don't know what to do. Now the actor in me is pretending that this is all normal and this is like we've rehearsed for months with these goats. We know exactly what we're doing with these goats. The goats look out into the crowd. The lights are blinding them. There's nowhere for them to go. The fence is closed behind them. By now they're kind of trapped. There's no way out the sides and they start to move and they start moving in the same direction. They're circle going around faster and faster and faster, panicking and sort of crying the way goats do. And then suddenly they all start crapping everywhere in total fear. And the almighty stench of crap goes up over the audience and they are laughing and they're loving it. It is the ultimate coup de théâtre. Now, sometime after this extraordinary wedding, Johnny calls me up. I'm a student. I've just, in fact, graduated in law at LSE at that point. Uh, I didn't become a lawyer, but I, I, was, I had graduated in law. And he calls me up and he says, listen, I want you to do me a favor, Danny. I want you to go down to Bow Street Magistrates Court on Friday uh, at 4 p.m. There's a case I want you to look at. Uh, and I can't be bothered to come all the way from Israel. It's too far. You're a lawyer. You'll know what you're doing. Just tell me what happens. Now, I said, is this a prank? He said, no, 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 really. It's not a prank. It's absolutely serious. Just go to the court. So 
I make, way, make my way down to Bow Street Magistrates Court. And it's not very convenient for me by, you know, in terms of timing, because I have a party that evening. Uh, I'm planning to go to South America with my girlfriend at the time. We've got a bit of a leaving party. So it's not great timing, 4 p.m. on a Friday. But dutifully, because it's Mr. M, I go down and I attend the, um, the court. Now, the case was a guy called Goldin. And he was being extradited to Israel for some reason I don't know. And as the judge is wittering on, as they do, uh, and uh, I'm thinking about the party, and I suddenly realized that I hadn't really paid much attention to what he'd just said. So the gallery was quite full, and I turned to the, the guy next to me, and I say, um, what did the judge just say? And he looked at me and he said, what's it to you? And I said, uh, well, I just wanted to know what he said. Who are you? Uh, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm nobody. I'm just, I'm just curious. <laughs> anyway, the end of the case, Golden is gonna get extradited. I walk out of the court, round the corner into the phone box. This is pre-mobile phones. And I call my girlfriend to tell her to put the chicken in the oven. And I turn around and I am absolutely surrounded by photographers and journalists and they're all looking at me and they're all shouting at me. I come out of the phone box, who are you? How do you know Golding? What's going on? How do you know Golding? I'm like, I'm nobody, I'm nobody. I'm thinking, oh my God, what a shlemiel, what an idiot I've been. I, I go to my bicycle, they're following me to my bicycle. I'm unlocking my bike, they're shouting at me. Who are you? How do you know him? Uh, I, un I unlock the bike and they chase me down the street. I get home, I call Mr. M and I say, um, yeah, I didn't want to tell him what actually happened because I thought he's going to think I'm a real idiot. So I just said to him, yes, it's fine. A golden is going to be extradited. But by the way, who is this guy? And Mr. M says to me, well, golden is the biggest fraudster in Israel's history. I was sent to track him down, I found him, and I made sure that he was gonna get extradited back to Israel. And I said, great, thank you, thanks for telling me. The next morning, Mr. M calls me again. He says, what happened? I said, what, what do you mean? What do you mean what happened? He said, what happened? Apparently, my photo was on the front pages of all the Israeli papers. And on one particular very popular uh, Israeli paper, there was a photo of me and underneath it said, the mystery man. And there was this whole article about the mystery man and how he'd come out of the uh, court and gone into a phone box and said, put the chicken in the oven. And I said, I said, that's really funny. That's brilliant. That's fantastic. He said, no, it gets worse. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I tracked him down. The banks have just got in touch with me and they said, find the mystery man. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm not going to say that I sent some idiot down to the court to take my place. So I'm just going to uh, pretend to look for you for the next two weeks. And uh, when you've gone to South America, I'm going to say that you've gone to ground. And so I went to South America. Golden got seven years. And I am still on the run. <laughs> True story. Thank you. Oh, that is absolutely, <laughs> abso yeah, we're all going, woo! Thank you, Danny. That is absolutely brilliant. That should be our catchphrase. Put the chicken in the oven. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, next up, we have Arifa. And uh, she is pretty extraordinary. She's packed more in her life so far than most of us might do. Um, at twice her age. She pretty much became an activist at the age of 14 after reading the book Daughters of Shame. Uh, she's currently studying for a BA in Persian and history at SOAS. And I'm not going to tell you anything more because really I think you should just 
listen to what she has to say and her incredible story. Thank you, that's so kind, Laurel. I was brought up to keep secrets, ugly secrets about bullying, coercion, fear, which were all part of everyday life in my family. I was taught that it was shameful to discuss things with outsiders. And that if I did, I'd be compromising my family's honor. Is it the most important thing in my mother's life? And that's why I didn't tell anyone when she showed me a photograph of the man she said I had to marry. I knew it was wrong. I knew I was too young to leave school or to get married. And it felt all wrong being forced to marry a man I didn't know, but I didn't tell. I kept that secret. I buried it. I ran away instead of going through with the marriage and my family disowned me. You have shamed us. You are dead in our eyes, they said. And I kept that secret too. As I tried to make my way in life, I kept my head down and my eyes averted because I didn't want people knowing how worthless I was. Those words that I've just shared with you, I may have said them in my voice, but they are not my words. They are somebody else's story. That is the opening paragraph of Jasvinda Sangira's Daughters of Shame. And I received this book on the 23rd of May, 2011 from a girl called Salah Zahid, my best friend. I received the book a day after I had tried to take my own life because I was deeply upset and struggling um, with my own issues. And she gave me this book and it was suddenly a lifeline. I, all of these stories that I was reading about women and men that had been abused by honor, I had seen the same thing happen in my local community, born and raised in Walthamstow, East London. Um, very thankful that I didn't go through any of the experiences that Jasvinda went through in her book. I was raised by um, a very kind mother who came from that culture, but my grandfather was a politician. He was a Labour councillor and mayor of Walthamstow. And so I spent a lot of my youth with him in sort of going, going along to meetings and, and meeting lots of different people and just having a very happy, carefree childhood. And then suddenly being confronted with the fact that this was happening in my own community, I couldn't take it. There was one particular story in the book that broke my heart so much it moved me to act. And it was the story of Uzma Arshad. Now Uzma was born and raised in Pakistan, but came to the UK to marry a man who had been born and raised here of Pakistani descent. But she quickly changed, she adapted, she became westernized. So she started wearing clothes and sort of tighter clothes, makeup, straightened her hair. She had three children with this man. And somewhere along the way, somebody started a rumor that she was having an affair. So he left her, but he came back a year later and she said to her family, she said to her brother, you count the days before he kills me because she knew there was something wrong with the situation. She had insulted his honor, but this idea that she'd had an affair was going to ruin the reputation of the family within the community. Therefore she knew she, he, he, there was something coming. She never would have gone back though, if for one second she had thought he was going to harm their three children. Not only did he beat her to death with a baseball bat, he beat to death their three children, the youngest of which was a six year old girl. Around her wrist, she still had the wristband from the day before when she'd gone to the fair ground and had a wonderful time with her family. And when the police apprehended him and asked him how he could commit such a heinous crime, he said to them, I had to stamp out that fucking bitch's bloodline. And I had chills. I was reading this book at 14 on a bus, the 425 bus going down from Stratford. And I was sobbing at 14 thinking, Jesus Christ, how, what? this doesn't make any sense to me. So I did the only thing I knew how. I took the book to my school and I started talking about it to my friends. And that is a direct result at that moment is why we're here today. And I'll kind of take you through the journey of, of how I became sort of founder and executive director of Educate to Eradicate. But it started at 14, just with that book, that moment that hurt my heart so much. I went and spoke to some teachers, told them that the cause was important, that I cared about honor abuse and they'd never heard of honor abuse before. So I had to explain it, I had to learn first. So then I went to the charity that Jasvinda, the author of the book had set up and learned more about it myself. And the more I learned about it, the more invested I became. And then I went to my school and I said, right, I want to raise some funds for Carmen Nirvana. The work they're doing is important. We need to support them. So I came up with the idea for a charity dinner. 
Um, it's something that I'd seen worked in the community before. And I took my proposal to the head teacher and I said, look, Miss McFarlane, this is what I want to do. And she said to me, Arifa, I'd love to support this project, but unfortunately I'm leaving the school next year. So I can't approve something for next year, but wait, give it a year, come back, have another go. And I thought, okay, fine. So I took my proposal away, went to, came back the next year. We had a male head teacher, an interim male head teacher. I took my idea to him said look this is what I want to do and he said mm, don't you think that's a bit much for a, for a school kid Arafa wouldn't you be better off doing an assembly and I lost it I was like no who do you think you are like you're telling me I can't do something I know this is an issue that is important to me and you're telling me I can't no not having it so I waited and I went back the final year it's my final year at school school goes up to 16 year 11 GCSE year and this time I'm not leaving the decision with one person we've got a brand new head teacher and I say, right, I want a meeting with the entire senior leadership team. This decision is not going to rest with one person anymore. So I demand my meeting, I get my meeting, go in, and I explain to them where I'm going to get funding, how we're going to do this project. And they look at me and they're like, well, you've got your exams. What are you going to, how are you going to balance it? And to this, these are the exact words I gave them. None of you in this room care more about my grades than I do. For you, it's a statistic. For me, it's my life. If I didn't think I could do this, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you today. And there was silence. One second two seconds thank you for let, thank you for sharing your proposal we'll let you know good luck I got an email the next day your project has been approved good luck to what extent that was sarcastic I'll never know but I can tell you put on the best event that school has seen in over 100 years we had um guest speakers Baroness Scotland Chaz Akoshile from the forced marriage unit um Jasvinda herself came down to speak at the event we had 120 people from the community come uh, counsellors parents teachers everybody that had a stake in the issue a safeguarding issue for young people came and heard what we had to say a GCSE drama student wrote a play about forced marriage and got other students to enact it another GCSE dance student created a contemporary dance around the issue and exhibit and we performed that on the night we had an auction a raffle during that GCSE year I'd get into school at eight o'clock in the morning and leave at 8 p.m in the evening so when the school day finished at 3 30 I'd go into the deputy head's office and start my real work which was cold calling businesses asking them for sponsorship saying look if you promote this project we will let the community know that this business cares and therefore you will benefit too and so I raised this, the money needed we got um 120 people in, three course meal, auction, raffle, the lot of it, everything was donated, a whole bunch of young people put on this event together. And not only did we raise £5,000, I left that school with seven A stars and six A's. So I showed Mr McCormack that I could do it, no, I shouldn't have said his name, I showed the teacher that I could, I could do it. Um, and I think that was it for me, just that one moment of self-belief that I knew I could do something and everybody else was telling me not to. And I did it anyway, because of the purity of the intention. I knew my cause was right. And that was all I needed really, that one moment to break that silence because I haven't stopped talking since. Um, after that moment ended at 16, I kind of, I was involved in this development bubble. The development issues are definitely a bubble. If you're on the outside looking in, working with Department of International Development and all those things, it's very inaccessible. Um, I grew up as a, Muslim, Pakistani, Iranian girl on a council estate, um, not very much privileged, one of the pupil premium students in Walthamstow, 37% of young people live in poverty. And yet by 18, because of my cause and the, what I'd picked, I was the only, I was the first UK youth delegate to the United Nations talking about the sustainable development goals and how gender equality and how forced marriage and FGM can be tackled on a national, international scale. So I won't fill in that journey. That's a whole other thing. That's a whole other story in and of itself. The most important thing is that it started with a book and I, I took that idea right to the top and then came right back down to the grassroots because I realized that the UN was a framework to work under, but they don't actually do any of the work. You wanna do the work, you come back down to the grassroots. So I came home, set up Educate to Eradicate where I deliver safeguarding training now to teachers, doctors, police officers, midwives on FGM, forced marriage and honor abuse. And my life has changed completely since I was 14 and it's continually changing now. I'm going through a massive identity crisis as well now. But I think the one thing that stayed the same was this one belief, this one quote, this one Katie Crick quote that a friend of mine sent me. And that's where I'm going to leave you with today. First, a Hamilton quote, what is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. I'm not going to be able to see the effect of all the work I've done, but it's still there. It's for the next generation. 
And finally, as Katie Crook says, changing the world isn't a big bang. It's not an evolution. It's the sum of billions of tiny sparks. And some of those sparks are gonna come from you. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> we're all, oh. Do you know something you said there, Arifa, amongst everything else is purity of intention, which I'll really take away. You're pretty extraordinary. Thank you so much. You're all extraordinary. Thank you for letting me share my story today. Oh, wow. Just so normally we would have had an interval tonight after Danny, um, but we're going straight through. Uh, one of the great things about our intervals was always that we couldn't get people back for the second half because they were all talking to each other and making connections and it broke down barriers. So uh, in the absence of that, we're gonna keep going tonight. And next we have the wonderful Ola. And Ola is a schools counselor and he loves public speaking and he also uh, tells me <laughs> that there's nothing else to tell you about him because he has no life, which I don't believe, but <laughs> those are his words, not mine. <laughs> Thanks, Ola, for being here tonight. Hi, thank you very much. <clears throat> Some people genuinely believe that they were born with the right to always be right. And some people call them customers. But the question is, how do you respond when you're confronted with such people? And the story I'm going to share with you this evening is how I learned to handle such situations. A few years ago, I was working for London Underground as a customer service assistant at Holland Park Station. Now, to put things in perspective, let me tell you a little bit about the sort of customers who walk through the station. They live and work next door to the likes of Simon Cowell, Robbie Williams, in short, the kind of people who I was tempted to shout out to one day and say, oh, why don't you just adopt me? Now, it was one Monday, more Monday morning in November. I was on the early shift and I was sitting in that assistance box. I don't know if you know it's when you walk into underground stations. It looks like a TARDIS. That's what we staff call it anyway, because it's where we carry out our time travel, where we start reflecting on questions like, how the hell did I end up here? What happened to my life? And out of the corner of my eye, I spotted him walk into the station, His Majesty, the customer. Now, years of training had prepared me for this moment. Years of customer service brainwashing, I mean training. And I had a performance target of 10 seconds to get from the box to the station, to the gate where the customer was standing because we all we had these key performance targets. And it didn't help that I had Jobsworth Ali, who was the station manager, in the back office, he was watching on the CCTV monitor to see how long it would take me to get to, if I would even get up from the box. Now, before I started to walk there, I was thinking to myself, hmm, how am I going to, I was rehearsing in my head what I was going to say, because this is what, how they, these people expect you to greet them. I would say, welcome. Whatever you're about to say next, you are right. I'm here for you to use and abuse as you choose. That's how I felt in my head. But I just ran out. I ran up to, the, to him anyway. And I said, how can I help you, sir? He took one look at me as if he was looking at a specimen. And then pointed at the ticket machines. He said, 12 pounds for a one day travel card. You people must be taking us for a ride. And then he continued, he said, oh, I'm not paying that. I wasn't born yesterday. And I was thinking to myself, well, that's a shame because if you were born yesterday, you would have traveled for free. And for a split second, we eyeballed each other. 
And we had that moment of connection. I don't know if you know that connection that two male animals have when they have for the first time they meet and they think, mm, we're thinking the same thing, aren't we? Can I beat you up? But then I remember that I was on duty. I can't be thinking those kind of thoughts. Then he continued. He looked at me and said, let me into the station. Open the gates for me. And I thought to myself, no, you need a ticket. Do you have a ticket or an Oyster card? You can use your Apple Pay on your mobile phone if you want, or you can use your credit card. You have a different ways, of, different ways of paying if you wanted to go through. And he said, no, I don't need any of those things. I use, I use this station a lot. I come here every day. And I know everybody who works at this station. I know David. I know Isabel. I know Mohammed. And they all let me through. Now, up until this point, I had been working at London and at, the, at Holland Park Station for three years. David, I knew. Isabel, I knew. Who was Mohammed? And I thought to myself, I don't know who Mohammed is. So I proceeded to tell him, oh, uh, so I think you might have the wrong station here. There's no Mohammed working here. I don't know if you've ever tried to correct somebody and almost immediately you realize, hmm, that was a bad move. Because almost immediately he seemed to double in size in front of my very eyes. Up went the shoulders, up went the nostrils, down came the testosterone. How dare you challenge me when I say somebody works here, they work here. I know everybody who works here. In fact, I haven't seen you work here. Do you work at this station? Who are you? And he spoke with such confidence and conviction that for a brief moment, I started to doubt myself. I even started to doubt my own existence. I thought, Am I actually real? Am I standing here right here at this moment? But then another part of me said, no, 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 no. You can't be taking stuff like that from him. Like, don't let him talk to you like that. You're a Lagos boy. I was about to give him my Lagos graduation speech, which starts something like, don't you ever, ever talk to me like that again. But I thought twice about it. But then just at that moment, Jobsworth Ali came out of the side office. What's going on here? And the customer looked at him and he said, oh, hello, Mohammed." And then Jobsworth Ali, who I thought, but I didn't know what was going on here. And he said, hello. At that very moment, another customer walked in from the streets and walked into the station. And he used his Oita card to try and open the gates. And this new customer just walked back. I don't know if you know those kind of people who try to piggyback when people are going through the station. So he walked through. And then as he walked through the gates, he looked back at me and shot one triumphant smug look. Yeah, as if to say, hmm, the house always wins. But this time I was so angry, I was so furious with him and with myself and with even with, with Jobs with Ali. I said, why did you stand there and let that happen? Is your name Mohammed? And he said, no. So why didn't you correct him? And why did you let me look stand there looking like a fool? And you didn't even correct him. He said, he said oh, okay, 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 let's go into the back office. I think he was trying to, didn't want a scene to happen there, you know, he was trying in his mind, he was probably thinking, I don't want anybody to have their camera out and start taking, uh, taking uh, recording this scene because it might turn up on YouTube, you know what? Can you imagine the YouTube clip? Tube member, tube worker loses, has a meltdown. So he took me back into the, in the back office and then said, calm down, calm down, calm down. Breathe in, breathe out. And I was still fuming. So, oh, come on, go to your happy place. Go to your happy place. I'm, saying, I'm calm, I'm calm, I'm calm. I'm on a sea drowning in, I'm on a beach drowning in injustice. He said, no, 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 come on, come on, come on, come on, relax. Now, look at the CCTV monitor. What can you see? You can see TV, um, ticket inspectors downstairs on the platform. Let them deal with the guy. It's not your problem. But you, you're stuck in this cycle of wanting to be right. And sometimes you just have to let it go because nowadays you're going to be confronted with all sorts of people. People who are going to call you all sorts of names and are not even on your birth certificate. People are going to confront you with alternative facts, fake news. People are in their own bubble and you're not going to change their minds about what they think. But you, you have to let it go for your own mental health and emotional well being. Otherwise, you might end up spending the rest of your life trying to state the stupidly obvious, 
to be obviously stupid. And I thought, hmm, sounds like you're making some sense there. So I had calmed down a bit and as I walked away and as I walked back to the TARDIS, I heard him say, hmm, by the way, you took 11.5 seconds. But <laughs> when I'd looked at my clock, I knew it was 10.8 seconds. And I was about to say, mm, come on, come on, you let it go, come on. But I, I just thought to myself, yeah, I'm the one who needs to let it go right now. And that's how I learned how to deal with people who always believe they have the rights to always be right. And how I learned to deal with this in myself as well. Uh, thank you, Ola. <laughs> Uh, who was Mohammed? I guess we'll never know. <laughs> nope. So finally, oh, thank you everybody. We come to our last storyteller of the night and it brings us pretty much uh, right up to the present. All these stories have been somewhere in the past and we now bring you to Stefania. Stefania uh, is originally from Italy. She uh, trained as a doctor and then she changed careers and she also trained as an actress. I think those two are incredible combinations. She's currently working on the front lines as a doctor, Stefania. Thank you so much, Laurel, for really giving me this opportunity to contribute to the art community, really. And to me in particular, the omnibus theater has always been kept uh, dearly in my heart. And I wonder, is it possible that behind your biggest conflict, there might be lying your greatest gift? You see, I used to run ultra marathons, and the one that had the biggest impact to me was a, a 250 insane kilometers across the desert in Algeria, across the Sahara Desert. And here we go, after endless hours of running, walking, crawling, just dragging myself really, and dehydrated food and dehydration and a short collapse along the way as well, I get to the last checkpoint, which was 20 kilometers from the finish line. Here we go, I'm there, but uh, my mindset is not doing well. I really just want to give up, warm bath. And it's really dark, actually. It's pitch dark. And I just had a lot of issues to see the signposts along the way in the last previous few hours. So I'm really terrified and actually, I might get lost. I don't have a GPS. And while I'm thinking all of this, and I'm really close to make like a final decision of like, just let it go. A Spanish runner grabs my rucksack and says, vamos, together, vamos, I have a GPS. <laughs> and before I know, I'm back on the road. <laughs> and I'm just following him. And actually what I can see, I can only see his shoes. So dark outside. <laughs> but I can see, you see, I can see these like little rounded bright things and the back of his Nike shoes and I just follow and I tell myself one step at a time. And then after a few hours, we really lose our hopes because we feel oh, we should have gone, we should have got to the finish line by now. It's been quite a few hours. Maybe we got the route wrong. So we see a rock and we sit on the rock and um, you know, I'm done, I'm done. I'm all itching all over, I got scratches. My right Achilles is really hurting and half of my right leg is wrapped in this like medical blue sticky tape. My left knee is starting hurting now and our GPS has stopped working. So we're lost, we don't know what to do, where to go and it's really cold. And I'm like, I'm done, just let me, let me stay here big mistake. We stay for maybe an hour and I start shivering because it's so cold in the desert. It's not just like pitch dark. It's actually freezing. And I start shivering and I think, wow, this is no joke. I 
actually could be dying tonight. Kind of funny though, weird way. A bit stupid really to die this way. And then I think of all those runners behind me who had given up many, many kilometers ago. And I think, you know what? Not only I could be dying now, but I would be looking like I'm quitting. We go left. I would just go. We pick up a random direction. I would just go one step at a time. We had no idea. But five minutes later, we have people coming to us, clapping, coming out of the tent. We had gone to the finish line. The finish line was five minutes from where we had been standing on the rock. Because we didn't know. It's so dark in the desert, you don't see what is behind the corner. So that story of courage and resilience had come back to my mind in the recent days. So I'm now working in the intensive care unit as a doctor. I'm wearing my full PPE, the white jumpsuit. I look around, it's really surreal. You have all these patients intubated, some of them on their stomach, you know, we, we call it proning. And we got a nurse at the back side. They're all covered up, white jumpsuit. I tell my colleague, it feels like we're walking on the moon. And it's so silent. <laughs> it's like a macabre silence, actually. It's all like interrupted by beep, beep, beep. Or like, which is the sound and the jumps it makes when you walk and the legs touching each other. And I just think, one step at a time, just go to the next hour, the next shift, the next week. You know, I hate this PP. It gets so hot and everything is itching and you can't really hear properly and you can't really see properly, and it takes ages to do things that normally would take much less time. And you have a pair of gloves, and you have a second pair of gloves, and then you have your goggles, and you have your visor, and then you have the mask. And the headache, the headache is awful, it, it kills me. So I just wanna get out of this PPE, and when I'm safe, and I finally can, I remove my PPEs, and I'm taking my mask the last, and so I look in the mirror, and all these signs here, like little bruises, it's quite sore in the middle. I think it's not really good for an actor to have permanent signs in, in her face, isn't it? And it's like, you know, if I have to give a meaning to all these two months, among all the beautiful lessons in a way of the tragic lessons that I learned, is that I feel while I'm putting physically all this protection and masks, all this PPE, in a way, I am unmasking emotionally, step by step. Because the conflict that I have had in the last decade is probably going to a point of resolution, a point of peace. You see, I've always been very ashamed of when I was in the, in the acting community, I would never say I was a doctor because I would feel, well, what about they judge me? What about they say, oh, you can't possibly express emotions properly because you come from a scientific background. So I always felt really ashamed. Or oh, in a medical community, I wouldn't say I'm an artist because I don't want to hear things like, oh, that's why you're an emotional freak. So I, during these last two months, this conflict has become so hard and so and was unbearable, then finally it broke down. And I feel like I'm kind of declaring publicly, and I don't know, it sounds very politically incorrect word, but it's like I'm coming out, accepting these two coexisting parts of myself. So I'm walking down the world and I get to this other place, but there is, um, there is like a COVID ward behind, but there is a little screen, more or less this size. It's like a FaceTime and you can see patients. <laughs> so you don't have to go inside the ward and you don't need to touch them. You can just give a consultation from the FaceTime. And I can see four patients 
three of them are asleep. One is reading a book. And there are like nurses around and they look like little men in their white jumpsuits. It's like uh, one of those video games where these little white men are moving among targets. It breaks my heart to think how scary it must be for patients to open their eyes and see aliens. That's how we look like. <laughs> the guy who's reading a book seems to be looking at the screen. I wave at him. He waves back at me. <laughs> so sweet. And then I think, that's it. That's him. That's her. That's them. <laughs> it's the human beings. You see? It's the stories behind the people. It's the humanity. A humanity that now, even more than ever, we need to see in the individuals and we need to bring. Because now, even with these all physical barriers, it's absolutely crucial that we look at people, we see them, we recognize them. Is <laughs> you know, the stories behind, not just the patients, but also my colleague who, has been self-isolated for two months because they have young children, or the nurse who is now devoured by guilt because her husband had died of COVID. And apparently she brought the COVID home and she didn't know if she had no symptoms. Or the bus driver or the Uber driver who come to a knee with shortened breath, and all the nurses and doctors we hear on the news that have died on the front line, all these stories. We need to see the, the people and the humanity. And I feel I have been so ashamed of being both a doctor and actor for so long. But actually, I'm blessed because I had the privilege to contribute to the community, to see and to impact, impact human stories. And I have the possibility and the skills to give voices to human stories on stage, on the film set. So I say, if medicine saves the body, I believe artists are equally important because ultimately art can save the soul. Thank you. Wow, well done, thank you. Well, gosh, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Stefania and Fayan and Ola and Dele and Arifa and Danny for giving us your time tonight and your stories. Really quite incredible. And for giving your time to Omnibus. And as Stefania said, we need art as much as anything else. So if you feel like donating something tonight, that would be absolutely wonderful. We'd love to see Omnibus open its doors when it can and when it's safe, like we would all sorts of art institutions. And um, I just wanna say again, thank you. The art of storytelling is quite extraordinary. And I just, I'm really privileged to have met you all. And thanks again from me and from all of us. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.